Okay, so Boker Tov, as we, uh, when we're not in Coral Springs, we like to play geography. So uh, just showing you a little bit of background because right now we are not in Coral Springs and uh, we're just allowing you to guess and see, just to start off with a little fun, if you could recognize this neighborhood. It shouldn't be too complicated, but uh, nevertheless, let's do that, okay. So now that we've done that, let's start the class. Okay, so here we go. It's gonna be a little shaky, again, since I do not have my usual stand. And uh, walking around over here, as we sit down, we will make the bracha, the blessing, on the delicious coffee. And then we will share the story here we go. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech Olam Shehakoil Nihiyo Bidvaroi. Ah, this is good. It is good. Okay, so <clears throat> I was here this past week, still here, for two beautiful simchas for my nephew and my niece. My nephew, Zalman Denberg, got married this past week. Beautiful, beautiful chatuna, chasana, beautiful wedding. My niece, my sister's uh, daughter, Sarah Zaitlin, got married this uh, past week as well. And uh, the beauty wa was, uh, the added beauty to this was that they were both on the same night two different uh, halls, and it was uh, a good problem. It was a good problem to go ahead and uh, have to be at two weddings. And um, basically the decision of which wedding to hang out more was this, where the menu was better. Only kidding about that. We were both beautiful weddings and uh, a beautiful simcha. So on Shabbat, I heard a beautiful story, and I decided that's what I'm going to share this morning. Uh, initially, I decided to share maybe something more in depth, something more complicated. But there's 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 other weeks and other opportunities for that. So I decided since I heard this beautiful story, and it is related to <coughs> Yud Shvat, which I spoke about last week. Uh, just to briefly mention, I mean Yud Shvat for those who are uh, a little less familiar with the Chabad Hasidic calendar, it doesn't necessarily. Uh, 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 ring a bell or mean that much to you but in the Chabad world and really in the Jewish world it, it's a very special day it's the day that the previous Chabad Rebbe the 6th Chabad Rebbe passed away and the day that the Rebbe Rabbi Menachem and Mishnesen, uh, became the leader of Chabad and really uh, inspired an army of goodness throughout the entire globe and so much good that has been done by the leadership and the inspiration of the Rebbe. And that's what the day Yud Shvat marks. But the reason why I'm sharing this, even though last week we spoke about Yud Shvat, is because this Friday, this past Friday night, I was in Shul, I was at a synagogue here, a small synagogue here in this part of the world. And... Um, and I heard this beautiful story that relates to the, the celebration, but it's a meaningful story and the lesson that, that, uh, that comes with it. Which I believe is a beautiful lesson as well. The story I heard from, a, from Rabbi Shalom David Gaisinski, very a great scholar, very uh, special individual, and he gave a um, a, 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 a Torah lecture uh, on Friday night, and he shared the following story. He says, several years ago, on Yud Shvat, now the original Yud Shvat that I keep on mentioning, the 10th of Shvat, occurred um, in 1950. So we're talking about 71 years ago. Um, ten years ago, ten years ago, there was a fellow in a town, 
that some of you are familiar with called Lakewood, which is not a Chabad uh, community. It's really a, uh, an Orthodox community, but it's not a Chabad community. And um, he is more what we would call a Hungarian Chassid, you know, one that wears perhaps a typical Shrimal. Uh, you know, that background, which is different than Chabad, uh, you know, they have their own sort of culture and uh, etc. And he, um, and it was Shabbat Yud Shvat, like this year Yud Shvat was on Shabbat. And he gets up and he asks, even though he was usually a quiet type of fellow, not, not the ones who were uh, the noisemakers or the outspoken ones in the synagogue, and he asks if he can please be called up to the Torah. So they gave him an, what, what we all know as an aliyah. They gave him an aliyah. Um, after that, you know, people were kind of curious why he asked for an aliyah. It wasn't his style. So he said, today is Yud Shvat. Today is the day that the previous Rebbe passed away and the Rebbe became Rebbe. And that's why I wanted an aliyah. And they were surprised because he wasn't a Chabad Hasid, a Chabad disciple. That wasn't his lifestyle. Mm-hmm. That wasn't mm-hmm. his upbringing. Etc. So he said, let me tell you the following story. He said that when, um, that when he just came from what we today call the old country, he came from Hungary or Poland, possibly, but uh, from one of those two countries, when he came here to the United States after, a couple of years after the war, um, he had a very, very difficult time finding what we call in Yiddish or in Hebrew, parnosa, a livelihood. It was difficult then for people who came uh, for various reasons. Number one, it was very difficult to find a place that, that would not allow it, that would allow you not to work on Shabbat. Today it's sort of standard, but then and it's actually... There's even certain discriminatory laws to protect that. But then, many observant Jews had a very, very difficult time finding work at a place which would allow them to keep Shabbat. In fact, in fact, there were Jews that were so committed, perhaps you who are listening here, your father or grandfather, who were so committed to Shabbat that they would get a job, from Sunday or from Monday to Friday, and then they would just not come in for Shabbat and they would be fired. And the next week they would, again, make the effort to find a job uh, just for four or five days. So that generation, who was an amazing generation, and what they went through, etc. So he was having a very, very difficult time finding parnasa, finding a livelihood, and that's a, a terrible stress. On a, on a father of a family that needs to sustain his family as uh, probably many of us have been through that and it's a very, very stressful. He tried, he tried, he wasn't successful. So finally he hears or that there is this great tzaddik, there's this great righteous holy man in New York, in Brooklyn, New York by the name of Rabbi Yosef Yitzhak of Lubavitch known also as the previous Lubavitcher Rebbe, Chabad Rebbe. And he decides that even though he's not a Chabad Chassid, he's going to go ask him for a blessing. He heard about the greatness and holiness and the, and the tremendous Mesirat um, Nefesh, the tremendous self-sacrifice that the previous Rebbe had for Russian Jewry. He decided that he's going to go ask him for a blessing. A blessing of a tzaddik, the Talmud tells us, has a special power, God listens uh, to a tzaddik and uh, and uh, we'll go we'll go try to get a bracha. So he calls up to try to get an appointment, and he's having a really difficult time getting an appointment. It's very difficult. First of all, at that time, the previous rebbe was already ill. He was uh, he had serious illness, and there was a, many many people who wanted to see the previous rebbe, and he just wasn't being successful. He was calling and calling and calling and trying to get an appointment and. He just was not being successful. So finally he decides that he's not giving up. He's just going to go. He's going to take the train or the subway and he's going to... He's going to... uh, He's going to... 
figure it out. He's going to travel to Brooklyn and he's going to get an audience or find a way to get a blessing from the previous Rebbe. And um, he, he decides to go the following Sunday to go and visit and get a bracha, get a blessing. This was in 1950. And uh, I don't recall what the English date was, but the Hebrew date of that year, Shabbat, 1950, was Yud Shabbat. He decides that he's going to come to Brooklyn on Yud Aleph Shabbat, the 11th of Shabbat. Right after Shabbat, the very tragic news to world Jewry uh, breaks that the previous Rebbe passed away on that Shabbat morning. That Shabbat morning, the previous Rebbe passed away. This, our Jew, his name, by the way, is Rebbe Mordechai Grimwald, as I was told the story. This Jew, Rebbe Mordechai Grimwald, Rebbe Mordechai, decides that he is not deterred and he will come Sunday morning and he will ask a blessing from the previous Rebbe <coughs> because as we know, and we already find this, its origin and source of this already in the Torah, in the Bible itself, that to ask a blessing uh, from a tzaddik, not so much from the tzaddik, but to ask the tzaddik to intercede on your behalf to God Almighty is something that we already find in the Torah that was done with great tzaddikim, great holy righteous men. So he decides that he's coming to, uh, to Brooklyn and he will ask his blessing. He takes the subway, he um, arrives in Crown Heights, comes out of the train station, and uh, he, uh, he arrives at the funeral of the previous Rebbe. There were hundreds, thousands of people there, and it's really, really difficult to get through. But he, he's determined. He pushes his way through, and um, he gets to sort of the inner circle, to the inner circle of the, of the, around the previous Rebbe's coffin. And here, try as he might, he just cannot get through. Now, the reason why he couldn't get through from this last, last barrier is because the son-in-law, the future Rebbe, who at the time was known as the Ramash, which is an acronym for Reb Mental Schneerson, who became the next leader of Chabad. And the Ramash gave him a very, very sort of strict uh, order that nobody could approach the coffin if he did not, and I'm going to say this in Yiddish, and you can give me a thumbs up if you understand the Yiddish. Uh, the Ramash ordered that no one can approach the coffin if they did not if they say, if they if they have been nicht gegangen in Wasser, they sind nicht gewen in Wasser. What is Wasser? Wasser literally means water. In this case, what it means is that if they did not go to a ritual mikveh, you know, the Torah mentions that for many forms of impurity, you have to go to a mikveh, to a ritual mikveh, and although, other than for women. Today, it's not a biblical obligation for men to go into water, but nevertheless, there is a, there is a, a concept of going to the mikveh to achieve extra purity. And the Ramash ordered that nobody could approach the coffin of this great and holy a man um, unless they went into Vasar, unless they went into the mikveh. So when this fellow tried to get through this inner ring, one of the fellows turned around to him and, and saw that he was really determined to get to the coffin and said to him, Bistu given in Vasar. Did you go into water today? Because everybody was actually going to, you know, trying to get to the coffin because it's a special merit to help with the carrying of the coffin, to assist the deceased. It's... Uh, it's a special mitzvah because it's a everlasting kindness that you will that you're doing to the to the, the deceased and so on. So therefore, he asked him to give an 
So this, our Jew over here, the Mord Grimwald, responded in the following. Listen to this. He rolled up his sleeve. Now, since I'm holding the phone, he rolled up his sleeve. And this has, uh, uh, this resonates with me as well. Uh, as re I'm sure it will resonate with, with the rest of you, but I'll, uh, but I'll explain that in a moment. He rolled up his sleeve. Made the, I'm, I'm online. You could listen. I said the story yesterday. He rolled up his sleeve. And he um, he showed the, uh, the the numbered tattoo that he had on his arm because he was a Holocaust survivor, and he said the following. He said, "Wasser, ich bin gewend in fire." He said, "You're asking whether I was in water. I was in fire. I was in the camps of the Holocaust, whether it was Auschwitz." Ich bin gewed in fire. I was in fire. When he when he mentioned when he shouted that out, the Ramash, as mentioned before, the Rebbe, the future Rebbe, overheard this sort of this little quick conversation, and he heard this person's emphatic response: Ich bin gewed in fire. I was in fire. And the Rebbe, the Ramash, turned to this sort of so-called bodyguard and said to him the following in Yiddish, lost them to him. Allow him to approach. He approached and he uh, put in his request for a blessing for Panosa to the holy tzaddik, the deceased holy tzaddik, Rabbi Yosef Yitzchak of Lubavitch of Chabad, and uh, gave his respects, of course, as well. And he leaves, he leaves, he gets back onto the train. And um, gets down on the subway. And, you know, he's a yid from the old country, doesn't at the time know any English or barely. And he knows that he has to get off at Chambers Street. Let's see if you can guess what that is. Chambers Street is what we know as Chambers Street. But he didn't, uh, you know, so he went around the train uh, asking people if they know where Chambers, Chambers Street is. Nobody knew what he was talking about. What's Chambers Street? So... Um, there was another, a fellow, sort of Lanzmann, a fellow uh, Jew, who notices that this fellow is, is, looks a little uh, uh, lost or, uh, or disturbed, and he walks over to him, and he says to him, Reb Yid, my fellow, uh, my fellow uh, Lanzmann, could I, could I help you? What's, what's the issue? So he tells him he's looking for Chember Street. Well, the guy immediately understands. He's a Lanzman, knows the language, and so on. He understands what's going on. And um, he says to him, okay, I'll gladly help you out. I'll direct you when to get off, etc. But then our Jew, the Mordechai Grimwald, turns to him and says, you know what, what I'm really looking for is Panusa. I'm looking for a job. I'm here, I'm new in the country, and I cannot find a job. That's what I'm really looking for. So he says, you know what, I can help you. I own a business, and I will help you, and I'll give you parnosa. I'll give you sustenance. On the way back from his prayer, he was answered. Hashem, God Almighty, heard the prayers of the deceased tzaddik, and, uh, and it, came, it, came by, it came through quickly, very quickly. And Mordechai Grimwald re, uh, ends off his story saying, as a result of that, I was able to, you know, of course, have a livelihood. Eventually, I went out on my own. I started my own business. And thank God, I was, I was successful. I did well. So here, he says, that's why today, Yad Yud Shvat, I want an Aliyah. Because it was both the previous Rebbe and the future Rebbe who, who, who assumed leadership on Yud Shvat the following year that I was able to to have this blessing and be able to stand on my feet, sustain my family, because he allowed me to approach 
He could have said, no, you can't approach. But he didn't. He said, lost them to get allowed to approach. So this is a beautiful, beautiful story uh, that I heard on Friday night from Rabbi Shalom David Gaisinski. And uh, I just thought, you know, sometimes you could overanalyze a story, but why not? Because if you could uh, take a lesson from it, in addition to the just the beauty of the story in its raw state, without my added sort of insight, because the story on its own is just a beautiful story. It's a beautiful story uh, on, on, on various levels. It's a beautiful story in the power of belief in the holy tzaddikim that a person would make that effort and come and travel just to get a blessing that shows the power of faith that a, that a person has in the holiness and goodness of, of great people that in itself is a beautiful lesson. The determination that he had to, in expressing that belief, sometimes we have that belief, but to, to actually act upon it, um, the Rebbe's, Rabbi, the Ramash's, Understanding that even though there were strict rules that nobody that didn't go in Vasa cannot in water cannot approach, understanding that go, being in that fire and that hell of Auschwitz, which I said has a resonates with me because my father was in Auschwitz, as you know from some of the classes that I've given in the past, that never recognizing that a Jew like that is much higher than somebody who's uh, been in Vasa, etc. There's also another lesson, which I think was also establishing a, um, a, 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 which we could just learn into the story. Why not? Why not? Because it's a, it's a good message. Where the Rebbe said, lost them to gain. Allow him to enter. Allow him to, to uh, approach. Um, which perhaps is a, is a indicator of the, of the Rebbe's vision uh, and and uh, um, of, of how he established the future uh, of Chabad's approach to Judaism, and as how it has developed over the years, where lost and two gain says two things. Lost and two gain means um, that there's something to get closer to because there's this tremendous amount of, of holiness here. But lost them tsugein also has the connotation that you need to take the initiative to approach. As this Jew made the tremendous effort, he made the tremendous effort to approach, two things are being said over here. And it's true of our entire generation that today the accessibility, the availability to holiness, to Torah, to Torah articles, to to um, holiness in the sense that it's so accessible and plentiful. You could go onto the internet, onto, onto different, uh, whether it's podcasts, whether it's uh, videos, whether it's uh, uh, articles, infinite, almost, um, that you could, on every topic, on every subject that you're interested, you could find the Torah's approach, God's approach. There is so much availability. At the same time, lost them to game. We it is only it's only something that's accessible if we take the initiative and we go ahead and we approach. I had a discussion. I had a, a discussion on Friday. On Friday morning, I had like a, a FaceTime Torah discussion with a dear friend. Although it's good to mention names of people who share good stuff, but nevertheless, for the privacy of this individual. I will not mention his name. And we had a we had a little discussion. This past Shabbos was the Shabbat of the splitting of the sea, where God splits the sea and the Jews go through after leaving Mitzrayim, after leaving Egypt on their way to Israel. And uh, so this fine Jew gives me uh, his thoughts, which is really mentioned in Hasidus and so on. But he just he said it in in a little bit plainer, down to earth language, which relates to our discussion over here. This fine Jew said. How did the splitting of the sea occur? Who, who brought about the splitting of the sea? Now, the common answer to that would be, usually you could give two answers to that. You could say God, of course, God Almighty. And you could say Moses, because Moshe Rabbeinu, Moses, went ahead, as the Torah relates, he took his staff and he hit the sea and the sea split. Fine, good, correct answers. However, this Jew 
finds you, says to me, based on what the Midrash tells us, the story behind the story, he says the sea did not actually split, and this is related in the Midrash, until Nachshon ben Aminadah, the leader of the tribe of Judah, jumped into the water, went up to his nostrils, and that's when the sea split. And in the words of this fine Jew, he said, why did it take for the water to split until Nachshon did what he did? So he says, because God wants to see that you are truly committed. When you are truly and fully committed, that's when Hashem, that's when God Almighty does the rest. And so too, today, as mentioned, Hashem, God Almighty, already put tremendous amount of information and availability for us to go ahead and access so much holiness and so much insight uh, to inspire us, to guide us, and our families, and those around us, our communities, our country, etc., etc. Abelostam Tugin, we have to allow it, we have to allow both ourselves and those around us, we have to make it accessible to those around us, but we have to also take the initiative. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And not just a superficial in- initiative, but we have to show that we're really committed. So that's the thought for today. Um, we, uh, we hope that you share these words of Torah, make it accessible to others. There is no greater gift that you could give to someone else then lozen em or the ear, him or her approach, make something wholly accessible. So share these words of Torah. Thank you for joining us. Have a fantastic week. Feedback is more than welcome, and requests for future topics would also be greatly welcome. Have a fantastic and a successful, healthy and joyous week. <laughs>